the light of truth into the darkness that he found around him. I'd yield back to my friend and uh, we'll stay around to, to hear what else we have, but uh, thank you very much. I want to thank my colleague from New Mexico. Thank you so much. And now I want to yield to uh, my good friend from North Carolina, uh, Mike McIntyre. Thank you so much. And Mr. Speaker, I share with these dear friends today, marking the passing into glory of Mr. Charles Chuck Colson. We knew Chuck as a dear friend and Christian brother, author, radio commentator, and also one who challenges us all to think more about our worldview. With his passing, our nation has lost an uncommon leader, a true example of the transformative power of Jesus Christ, and a reminder of the beauty of second chances in life. While some will forever remember Mr. Colson for his role in the Watergate scandal, I will remember and honor him for the grace and perseverance with which he advocated for the least of these in our society, those that were marginalized, those that were seen as helpless. Through his work with Prison Fellowship, the world's largest organization for outreach to prisoners and former prisoners and prisoners' families, and through his inspirational books and commentaries, Chuck Colson touched thousands of lives and advocated tirelessly for programs that would not only address the physical needs of those in our nation's prisons, but also their spiritual needs as well. And in addition, Mr. Colson's daily radio show, Breakpoint, during which he would share a commentary on the life of Christ and also on the Christian worldview on the issues of the day, was such a challenge and an inspiration to me that as a young lawyer in southeastern North Carolina in my hometown of Lumberton, I actually put copies of his breakpoint commentaries out on the coffee table so that those clients and prospective clients who came to our law office would take time to hear from this lawyer, Chuck Colson, whose life, whose life had been so transformed by the experiences he had gone through. And you know, when I think about his insights, it's because they were so challenging and so clear in their wisdom that they were so touching. His books challenge you to think deeply about your own calling in life. What was God calling you to do? And how could you take even the worst of experiences, such as he went, I remember describing looking out on the south lawn of the White House thinking he was just one door down from the president in the neatly manicured lawn. I remember Chuck two or three times in different testimonies describing that experience and thinking, you know, I've made it. But then Chuck Colson went from the White House to the very depths of understanding what it meant to be in prison. But instead of letting that ruin his life after the Watergate scandal, he came out of that with his life being changed. His great book, Born Again, was a bestseller back in the 1970s when I was in college. And I still remember when my own father, who passed into glory last year, read that book, that along with other experiences that happened to my own father, that book, Born Again, told a story that my dad could identify with and that helped to change his life. Having heard Chuck Colson speak at Montreat, where my own dad made his own Christian commitment, and hearing Chuck Colson speak at other events with the late Dr. D. James Kennedy down at Coral Ridge Ministries in Florida, and being with Chuck so many times here on Capitol Hill, being part of the lecture series that my good friend mentioned just a moment ago, that I still remember he organized here on Capitol Hill and would invite members of Congress to come and to think more deeply and challenge us to go beyond the politics of the issue. And then, in his monthly newsletter called Jubilee, he would have an editorial at the back that I regularly read and made sure that often I ripped that out and put it in a file because his thoughts were so provocative and challenging in terms of our own worldview. I also had the opportunity to get to know Chuck Colson and count him as a brother in Christ and as a friend, participating not only in the lecture classes here on Capitol Hill, but when he rewrote the book that he had written in 1982, Kingdoms in Conflict, which, great, which greatly touched my life as I thought about the possibility of, of one day maybe coming to this place. He rewrote that book on God and politics and challenged us to think about where we are in our faith as we deal with the tough times in the political world. So much so that my wife, Dee, asked me if for our 25th wedding anniversary, instead of a gift or going on a trip, could we be in the centurion program that Chuck Colson had. 
where he had 100 citizens from around this nation participate and spend an entire year studying the Christian worldview on issues ranging from health care to business, from medicine to education, from law and government, to issues within religion itself, and challenging us to study the biblical perspective and the Christian worldview, and to think how we deal with those issues as Christians in the everyday world. And so with those hundred citizens from across the country, my wife and I spent a year studying <coughs> under Chuck Colson's guidance and went to three different seminars that he hosted not too far from here in Washington. What an inspiration this man was because he didn't just teach, he didn't just talk, but he walked the walk and he changed lives by God's power in the process. And I know some of you are here with us today so often we shared the night before the National Prayer Breakfast that before we came and led the spiritual heritage tours here at the Capitol that so many hundreds of people have now done over the years that we made it a regular habit to go to Chuck Colson's annual prison fellowship dinner he had on the Wednesday night before the Thursday National Prayer Breakfast in February. And we look forward as much to that as being central to the celebration of what the National Prayer Breakfast was about because we knew the night before Chuck Colson was having his annual dinner, usually honoring some great religious leader or reformer in society before we had our spiritual heritage tour back here at the Capitol. He often also talked about his experience as a United States Marine at Camp Lejeune, uh, just on the edge of our congressional district. And he also talked about the practical ways that faith can change your life. That's the great legacy I know Chuck Colson would be pleased with today. We're talking about a man not only was a great author and speaker, but a man whose life changed lives and made a difference. Thank you very much. I want to thank my good friend and fellow centurion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike. Appreciate you being here. I want to yield to my other good friend, Robert Adderholt from Alabama. Robert. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Hulkren and uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I rise this evening uh, along with my colleagues uh, to honor the life and legacy of uh, Charles Colson, better known as Chuck Colson. Uh, many people remember Chuck Colson as the hatchet man for President Richard M. Nixon uh, and also the first member of the administration of, under Richard Nixon to go to prison. But uh, Chuck Colson is probably known better as a central figure in the Christian community since his conversion to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Some at the time of his conversion may have said it was a jailhouse conversion. However, however if you knew uh, and you, could, you looked at the life of Chuck Colson and saw the life that he led following his relief from Maxwell Federal Prison Camp in Alabama, you would come to a far different conclusion. Chuck Colson emerged from prison with a new mission, and that mission was to mobilize the Christian church to minister to pris prisoners. This would perhaps be his greatest contributions to the church and to the world. Chuck Colson was someone who uh, rose high to high places uh, in the eyes of the world. Uh, during his, uh, all the time during his time here in Washington and his political career. But it actually wasn't until Chuck Colson hit rock bottom uh, that really his life was turned around. It wasn't until he realized that he was living in darkness, that he was in need of a savior, and that he was powerless to earn God's favor, that his life actually turned around. If he were uh, with us here tonight, I think Chuck would unashamedly say that placing his trust in Christ recognizing that Christ had paid the penalty for his sins was the best decision that he ever made in his life. And I can say these things about Chuck Colson because I had the opportunity to get to know Chuck Colson personally over the last several years and the honor to call him a friend. Chuck Colson made many friends over his life and of course he will be missed uh, greatly by so many around the world and of course to Patty and his children uh, he will be sorely missed. But Mr. Speaker I feel sure that Chuck uh, has heard the words 
Well done, my good and faithful servant. So uh, thank you again, Mr. Holcomb, for the time you've yielded to me to honor Chuck Colson, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Adderholt. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for your words. Now it's my privilege to recognize a good friend from Iowa, Congressman Steve King. I thank the gentleman and Mr. Speaker. I rise also uh, to offer my most appreciative words uh, for the life and the gift to all of us that was the life of Chuck Colson. And a lot of us got to know Chuck Colson as he came before our conference uh, on occasion, a Republican study committee on occasion, and professed his conversion. And when one listened to Chuck Colson talk about how his conversion took place, how he hit rock bottom, as the gentleman from Alabama just said, how he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, and accepted a new direction in life, a direction in life that lasted for 40 years. A man that was at the pinnacle of power in the world found himself in prison for about eight months in Alabama. And out of that prison, he came back and, and hit bottom and was launched not at the pinnacle of a, the power in the world, not this world power, but he was at the center of the voice of the real power in the universe. And his voice, his inner voice, the spirit within Chuck Colson spoke to all of us. I, um, upon learning of his death, I sent out a tweet in those days, and it reads like this. Chuck Colson from Watergate to Evangelical Christian to prison fellowship to heaven in 80 years. Rest in peace, Chuck. How now shall we live? How now shall we live, Chuck Colson? Well, live by the model that he had. It was a blessing to all of us that he went through the difficulty that he did. If he hadn't been formed and shaped in that way, I don't know that we would have seen the Chuck Colson that we knew that we're saying goodbye to here tonight, that was, it was life we honor so much. His activities in prison fellowship set a standard that had not been seen in this country or in the world. And the recidivism rate of uh, prisoners that didn't take part in the prison fellowship is extremely high. I haven't committed my, that number to my memory. But it seems to me that those who went through the prison fellowship, those who accepted Jesus as their Savior, and I have met with them uh, in the prisons in Iowa that were part of the prison fellowship effort. The recidivism rate, by memory, not by research, was only 8%. That it was a tremendous thing to, to mentor so many prisoners in and out of prison and the families of prisoners. He went the place where he had known despair and gave hope in the very heart of the place where Chuck Colson had known despair. And I think that the testing of Chuck Colson turned him in the man that was a gift to this country and a gift to the world, to the entire world. I, I remember a prayer that I offered for years and years throughout the farm crisis years of the 80s, the difficulties of the 90s, and it was, Lord, please be finished testing me and start to use me. I don't know if Chuck Colson ever offered that prayer, but I think he would agree with me that there was a time that he was tested. There was a time that he, was, he, he went through that test in the pinnacle of power, and, it, and through that test in prison, and there's no question that the Lord used Chuck Colson, tested him for 40 years, used him for 40 years. Chuck Colson is a gift to America and a gift to the world. And I saw a little quote in an article written about him that I thought was um, useful and informative. Uh, his, his, the light just emanated from Chuck Colson. You knew that he understood. He wrote eloquently about the depth of his faith and the meaning in our lives in this life and in the next and the power of redemption. And this, and this quote uh, was written about him. I should actually note the author, and, I, and in fact I will because it's uh, useful. The author is Michael Gerson who, who wrote an article about him on April 22nd. He said, Chuck spent his, his, the last 40 years of his life dazzled by his own implausible redemption. He knew it was a gift. It was implausible that a person as humble as Chuck Colson could be the recipient of this gift of grace. Yet that gift shined from him uh, like a lamp on a lampstand, not under a bushel basket. It was a light that shined across this whole country and it shone into this United States Congress over and over again. Uh, he was a core for the values of our faith. He was a core for the values of our morality. He, he brought our thoughts together on the meaning of our service, our service here in this Congress and our service to the world. And I think he gave hope to many in despair. Many of those that served their time in prison were given hope and inspiration 
grace and salvation because of their exposure to Chuck Colson, the inspiration that he was. His life dazzled by his own redemption. We're dazzled by the life of Chuck Colson. And I yield back to the gentleman. Thank you. Thank, I want to thank my colleague from Iowa. It's now my privilege to yield uh, to my good friend from Texas, uh, Louis Gomer, whenever he's ready there. Appreciate my friend yielding. Thank you, Randy. It, it, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's such an honor to pay tribute to such a great man as Chuck Colson. You know, I first uh, read about Chuck Colson, uh, of course, after the Watergate uh, event occurred and all the events surrounding it. And then I was in law school when I read his book, Born Again. It sounded like this was a brilliant man who really and truly had had a conversion experience. His life had been materially changed. But then again, uh, there are those who, as a judge I saw, that would get in trouble and grab a Bible and say, I'm changed, and so, uh, you know, go easy on me, things like that. But this really appeared quite genuine with Chuck Colson. And I knew, as the Bible teaches, we'll be known by our fruits. What incredible fruits this man produced. Amazing. So over the years, uh, I stayed uh, in touch. He didn't know me personally during those years. But I listened to cassettes of his, of his sermons, his, his lectures. Uh, that tells you how far back it goes. They were cassettes. Uh, then I listened to CDs of his speaking and his lectures and, and sermons and and uh, would read his books and thank God he was so prolific that he was moved to write such extraordinary books. Um, and in fact, I came to realize with this kind of brilliance, and others have pointed this out, but it struck me back in the 80s, this is a modern day Apostle Paul. He has that kind of intellect, that kind of ability, and yet is able to discuss anything with anybody on any level, but his life is a living, breathing, walking testimonial. Um, I love the quote that Stephen Curtis Chapman used in, in Chuck Colson's own voice uh, in Heaven in the Real World where you hear Chuck's voice say these things. He's, Chuck said, I meet millions who tell me that they feel demoralized by the decay around us. Where is the hope? The hope that each of us has is not in who governs us or what laws are passed or what great things we do as a nation. Our hope, Colson said, is in the power of God working through the hearts of people. And that's where our hope is in this country. That's where our hope is in life. As he had pointed out on more than one occasion, our hope, the kingdom of God, will not arrive on Air Force One, and any hope of that happening is just misplaced. Well, uh, my days as a judge, my, I had a, still have a brother uh, about nine years younger, now Baptist pastor near Richmond, and Bill had acquired uh, Chuck Colson's new novel called Gideon's Torch. And as a man who had worked in the White House, to have him write a novel which, as you read it breathlessly, you, you realize these things could easily happen, every one of them, just as he spells out. It was an incredible book. When I, when I met Chuck Colson, I asked him, are you going to write any other novels? That was just a fantastic novel. And he said, my publisher tells me people are not buying my fiction. They want my nonfiction, and, and I want God to use me however 
He can use me, and if it's uh, more productive, more helpful to people to write nonfiction, I'll write nonfiction. He also said writing Gideon's Torch, a, vi a novel, was far more difficult than writing the nonfiction, which he does. But uh, I'm not sure that it's still in print, but I would hope that after his passing, it would have, or there would be a resurgence of requests, and people would get that book and greatly grow and benefit from it. I just wanted to share a couple of things from uh, his book, God and Government. He came to the Hill to provide this to many of us. And uh, as my friends that are here know, one of the <laughs> benefits of being in Congress, and there are plenty of things that aren't benefits, but one of the benefits is getting to become friends with people you have as heroes. And Chuck Colson was one of my heroes. He was someone I truly looked up to. And I've been invented from, and, and even before he knew me, he was a mentor. But uh, at page 69, he says, Whether or not God's existence can be proved, the evidence can be rationally probed and weighed. Lewis, he's talking about C.S. Lewis, does so compellingly, and he cites moral law as key, a key piece of evidence. Clearly, it is not man who has perpetuated the precepts and values that have survived through centuries and across cultures. Indeed, he has done his best to destroy them. The nature of the law restrains man, and thus it is, its very survival presupposes a stronger force behind it, God. Or consider the most readily observable physical evidence, the nature of the universe. One cannot look at the stars, planets, and galaxy, galaxies millions of light years away, all fixed in perfect harmony, without asking, who orders them? For centuries it was accepted that God was behind the universe, because otherwise the origin and purpose of life would be inexplicable. This traditional supposition was unchallenged until the 18th century age of reason when enlightenment, enlightenment thinkers announced with relief that the origins of the universe were now scientifically explainable. But in the past few decades, science has completely reversed itself on the question of the origin of the universe. After maintaining for centuries the physical universe is eternal, and therefore needs no creator, science today has uncovered dramatic new evidence that the universe did have an ultimate origin, that it began at a finite time in the past, just as the Bible teaches. Chuck Colson will be missed, but thank God and thank Chuck Colson that he has left us so much in the way of wisdom that we can draw from in the days ahead. Uh, we will be remembering his family and all of those who loved and missed Chuck in our prayers. And with that, I appreciate being yielded to on behalf of Chuck Colson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Gomert. Appreciate it. Well, I do thank my friends that have been here. There's many others who wanted to be here tonight and weren't able to. Uh, one of those was our colleague, Congressman Mike Pence from Indiana was unable to be here, but had uh, wrote, in a, uh, wrote a letter that uh, I will enter into the record as soon as we're finished here tonight. Many others also over the last couple of weeks have paid tribute to the life of Chuck Colson, and I'd like to recognize just a couple of them. Uh, one was uh, Reverend Billy Graham, evangelist, said that for more than 35 years, Chuck Colson, a former prisoner himself, has had a tremendous ministry reaching into prisons and jails with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. When I get to heaven and see Chuck again, I believe I will also see many, many people there whose lives have been transformed because of the message he shared with them. He will be greatly missed by many, including me. I count it a privilege to have called him friend. And again, that was Reverend Billy Graham. I do think it is amazing to look at some of the history of uh, the impact and really the decisions that Chuck Colson made that we talked about before he went to prison, his conversion. Many were skeptical about that, thinking it was a ploy uh, to get a lighter sentence. Uh, clearly it wasn't when you look at the fruits of what happened afterwards. And I just want to go through quickly a, a quick history of prison fellowship, something that again has had an impact on millions of people around the world. 
1976, a Watergate crook founds Prison Fellowship. In 1974, the Watergate scandal sent White House Special Counsel Chuck Colson to federal prison. A new Christian, he faced challenges and adversities that tested his faith and self-respect. Paroled in 1975, Chuck could easily have opted to close that book uh, on that dark time and move on with his life as, an in, in, as inconspicuously as possible. But Chuck knew that God wanted him to hold on to his ties to prison and continue to identify with his fellow prisoners despite the skepticism and scorn of Chuck's critics. So in 1976, with little more than a vision and the support of a few friends, Chuck began prison fellowship to proclaim to inmates the love uh, and the power of Jesus Christ. In 1977, the next year after the founding, uh, Prison Fellowship goes behind bars. At first, th uh, at first uh, through the support of the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Prison Fellowship began tr transporting dozens of Christian prisoners out of prison for intensive training through Washington discipleship seminars held in the nation's capital. Those prisoners then were returned to prison to evangelize and teach their colleagues. But in 1977, Prison Fellowship ran into a hurdle when a warden from Wisconsin refused to furlough one of his prisoners to attend the Washington Discipleship Seminars. Instead, he challenged, if your program is so good, why don't you bring it inside the prison? Chuck and his team were up for the task, and three weeks later, 93 inmates attended Prison Fellowship's first ever in-prison seminar in Oxford, Wisconsin. That seminar paved the way for hundreds of thousands of prisoners across the country to receive biblically-based teaching through in-prison seminars and Bible studies over the past 33 years. That first in-prison event also reinforced the importance of training local volunteers to go inside prisons and build relationships with inmates. Uh, today, Prison Fellowship's ministry relies on a volunteer network of well over 20,000 volunteers. 1979, Britain catches the vision. Prison Fellowship International takes off. In 1982, ex-bank robber uh, reaches out to prisoners' kids and starts Angel Tree. The same year that Chuck started Prison Fellowship, a former bank robber named Mary K. Beard was released from prison in Alabama. And at, in Chuck's life, as in Chuck's life, God's grac graciously transformed the shame of prison into a golden opportunity for ministry. In anticipation of Christmas 1982, Mary Kay organized Angel Tree, a ministry to provide gifts to prisoners' children on behalf of the incarcerated parents. Beginning with 556 children that first year, Angel Tree has since exploded into a geyser of ministry opportunities, reaching more than 400,000 American children of prisoners uh, every single year and their families with the transforming message of Jesus Christ. Over six million children have received gifts from Angel Tree uh, from their parents, donated by somebody else uh, in the name of their parents. Again, the, the lost victim oftentimes of crime. In 1983, Justice Fellowship hits the stage. As Prison Fellowship was expanding its ministry inside prisons, its leadership saw firsthand all the signs of a justice system in chaos overcrowded and violent prisons, neglected crime victims, communities shattered by crime. In 1983, Justice Fellowship was formed to promote biblical standards of justice in our nation's justice system. Justice Fellowship volunteers successfully in implemented reforms across the country, victim offender reconciliation programs, alternatives to incarceration for nonviolent offenders, victims' rights legislation, and more. In 1995, former California legislator and ex-prisoner Pat Nolan took the helm of Justice Fellowship and has since spearheaded efforts to pass the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act of 2000, the Rape, Prison Rape Elimination Act of 2003, and the Second Chance Act of 2007. In 1992, Operation Starting Line sweeps North Carolina. 1991, North Carolina Secretary of Correction Aaron Johnson was pondering the condition of his prisons and saw only one solution, spiritual transformation. In an unprecedented move, he invited Prison Fellowship into every prison in North Carolina to lead a contemporary version of an old-time revival meeting. So in the fall of 1992, using teams of professional athletes, musicians, comedians, and powerhouse speakers, Prison Fellowship's inaugural starting line evangelistic campaign swept through all of North Carolina's 90-plus prisons, sharing the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Since North Carolina, similar evangelistic events have spread to prisons all across the country, and in 1999, Prison Fellowship joined other Christian organizations to launch Operation Starting Line, now in, aff in affiliations of 37 ministries committed to prison evangelism. And then in 1997, a new kind of prison ministry is born, uh, Interchange Freedom Initiative, 
was founded, a values-based reentry program founded upon the teachings of Christ with the full endorsement of then-Governor George W. Bush, Prison Fellowship, and the state of Texas partnered to launch the very first IFI program in a prison unit near Houston. Uh, Interchange Freedom Initiative immerses its inmates, all volunteer participants, in spiritual, educational, vocational, and life skills training from an unmistakably Christian perspective. Today, IFI is active in both men's and women's prisons in five states, Arkansas, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, and Texas, and many other states are seeing the value of this, of really turning around recidivism, that we've got to provide all of this for our inmates, uh, for them to really have true life change. After God parted the Jordan River, allowing the Israelites to cross on dry land into their new home, he commanded them to erect a memorial of stones. These would stand as a reminder of the miracles God had done for them. Joshua explained, Today we seldom use stones as reminders of God's provision. Instead, we preserve God's works in written accounts and photographs. But the reason remains the same, to remember the hand of the Lord is powerful. That was from Joshua 4.25. And by his hand he leads us. Since this time, Prison Fellowship has continued to minister around the world. But Chuck Colson also had other uh, activities. I've already talked about, and Congressman McIntyre talked about, the Centurion Program, the impact that it had on our lives. A hundred uh, citizens each year going through the Centurion Program. Uh, he also started the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, which has, again, had a, a huge impact and has been directly involved in Breakpoint, uh, which is a weekly uh, radio program that's on. Uh, he has also was awarded 15 honorary doctorate degrees. And in 1993, uh, Chuck Colson was awarded the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion. This is a very prestigious award. It's given to a person who has made an exceptional contribution to affirming life's spiritual dimension. With the Templeton Prize is a $1 million cash award. Chuck Colson could have taken that could have spent it on his family. Instead, he took it and donated it to prison ministry to impact prisoners' lives. He also continued to donate throughout his entire life all of the royalties that he received uh, from his books, along with royalties from speaking. In 2008, uh, President George W. Bush honored Chuck Colson with the Citizens Medal, the President's Citizens Medal. So again, tonight we have taken just a few minutes uh, to honor a man who had a huge impact on our lives, Many of us in Congress have been impacted by him through his writings, through his teachings, through our friendship with him. He has also had a, a, a huge impact on prisoners around the world and the plight of prisoners and recognizing that all human life is valuable and needs to be respected and honored and uh, treated with that respect that it deserves. From the, the service today, there was a couple different things, and I want to close with this. I know I just have a few minutes left, uh, but uh, there was a couple different uh, readings that were done at the service, and I would like to uh, close with this. First, uh, one of the readings was from uh, Philippians 3, chapter 3 said, and uh, this is a very important passage for Chuck Colson, yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but the one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained this or already reached this goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. My friend Steve King had talked about this radical transformation in his life. And this verse pointed to that radical transformation where he could have had everything in this world, was right there next to the seat of power in the presidency and saw how fleeting that was. Could have had money and resources when he got out of prison uh, in a career in law or so many other things, but instead uh, decided to give back to prisoners and to others as well. Many would ask, why would he do that? 
Well, there was another passage that was read today. This was read by one of his grandchildren. And it said, uh, this is from Matthew 25. Uh, and this was Jesus said, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you in, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it when we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer to them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of those who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, you are the accursed. Depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and didn't take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Chuck Colson saw what his God had done for him, the incredible power of his redemption and transformation that happened in his life, and wanted to share that with those of greatest need. He saw that as, as the weakest, the poorest, those in prison. He was also dramatically impacted by his grandson, Max. Uh, Max is diagnosed with autism. And through Max, again, Chuck, Chuck saw the incredible value of every single life. And Chuck was a hard driver, a, a type A personality to the maximum. Uh, but he learned from his grandson, Max, patience and understanding uh, and love. And so I am so grateful again for the relationship that I've been able to build with, with Chuck Colson uh, and with his family. We will miss him so dearly. I want to end uh, this time again by reading from one of Chuck Colson's books, and I think this is uh, so powerful. This again was part of the ceremony today, the memorial service over at the National Cathedral. And this was from Chuck Colson's book. It's him uh, talking uh, in his book, Loving God, uh, and it's uh, quoting for Easter 1980. As I sat on the pl pat platform, and this is Chuck Colson talking, as I sat on the platform waiting my turn at the pulpit, my mind began to drift back in time to scholarships, to honors earned, cases argued and won, great decisions made from lofty government offices. My life had been the great American dream fulfilled. But all at once I realized that it was not my success God had used to enable me to help those in this prison or in hundreds of others like it. My life of success was not what made this morning so glorious. All my achievements meant nothing in God's economy. No, the real legacy of my life was my biggest failure, that I was an ex-convict. My greatest humiliation, being sent to prison, was the beginning of God's greatest use of my life. He chose the one thing in which I could not glory for his glory. Confronted with his staggering truth, I discovered in those few moments in the prison chapel that my world was turned upside down. I understood with a jolt that I had been what I had been looking at my life backwards, but now I could see. Only when I lost everything I thought made Chuck Colson a great guy had I found the true self God intended me to be and the true purpose in my life. It is not what we do that matters, but what a sover sovereign God chooses to do through us. God doesn't want our success. He wants us. He doesn't demand our achievements. He demands our obedience. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of paradox, where though the ugly defeat, through the ugly defeat of the cross, a holy God is utterly glorified. Victory comes through defeat, healing through brokenness, finding self through losing self. Chuck Colson truly was one of my heroes, someone I'm going to miss greatly, someone that impacted my family. I will think of him all the time when I look at my own son, Colson, named after Chuck Colson. But I just want to thank uh, my friends for joining me tonight to honor this great man, honor this great life, and be challenged together to follow the example that he left for us. Thank you, Chuck. We'll never forget you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Under the speaker's policy announced uh, January 5, 2011, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, for 30 minutes. 
Thank you very much. And Mr. Speaker, first let me suggest that I join with my colleagues in honoring the, the memory of Chuck Colson, a man who also meant a lot to me as, a, as an individual and a, uh, those of us who come from California and remember Richard Nixon coming out there and over the years and remember the great work that Chuck Colson did for our prison community in California. We're very grateful for that and uh, he taught us uh, really the true meaning of, com of Christian compassion and uh, I personally was a beneficiary of, of that knowledge and, and that spirit that he helped us uh, understand and develop within our own hearts. So I would like to join my colleagues in that. But today I rise to call attention uh, to the hundreds of millions of public dollars we have spent and continue to spend in the form of foreign aid to the People's Republic of China. Uh, better known as communist China to those of us who've spent years trying to fight that oppressive regime. Our national debt is over $15.7 trillion and is growing. $1.5 trillion more every year uh, than we are spending more, $1.5 trillion more than we're taking in. And 43 cents out of every dollar we spend is borrowed money and communist China is the single largest foreign holder of United States debt. The interest we pay on this ever-growing debt is increasingly squeezing out spending on other worthwhile programs. Why then are we borrowing money from the Chinese communist government to be uh, repaid, of course, with uh, interest and then using that borrowed money to finance programs in which we are giving money uh, to these various programs that goes to China, the country from whom we are borrowing. Uh, remember, the, gov uh, the government of this uh, aid recipient considers the United States its enemy. They are happy uh, to loan us the money, and they are happy that we are stupid enough to give it back to them as in, in terms of aid and, yes, other type of programs, including giving it back to them in investments. We are strengthening the government that considers us an enemy. And uh, as we look into uh, this situation, we know that they see the U.S. as their enemy, just as Japan saw us as their enemy before World War II, the Japanese militarists just as Nazi Germany saw the American people as their enemy, and just as the communist governments that threatened the world for over four decades after World War II, just as they saw the United States as their enemy. Yes, we are the enemy of tyrants and vicious regimes that are expansionary and threaten the peace and the freedom of the world. We can be proud of that. The Chinese know that. That's, the communist Chinese know that. That's why they don't like us. That's why they consider us their enemy. China is the world's largest human rights abuser. Chinese, China's government smashes those who advocate freedom of the press, freedom of religion, those who, uh, of course, who suggest that the Chinese government should be accountable to its people are arrested and thrown into jail or murdered. It arrests Chinese practitioners of Falun Gong, for example. Falun Gong is a Chinese religious movement which stretches or stresses yoga and meditation. Beijing has these devout and passive people, practitioners in a, in a simple yoga uh, religion that, that is, is meditation and yoga, you know, and these people are arrested and they're thrown into prison where they are murdered, and then the Chinese government, after murdering these people for their religious convictions, sells their organs and body parts. It doesn't get much more ghoulish than this. And on the international scene, China is responsible for promoting and facilitating the proliferation of nuclear technology between North Korea Pakistan, Iran, and others. China is responsible for empowering the Burmese junta that imprisoned Aung San Suu Kyi for years. It has allied itself with rogue regimes all over the world, like Sudan and, other, and, and in Venezuela, and other regimes that are, that are tyrants in their own country and threaten the security of their, of their neighbors and of the United States. 
China's aggressive foreign policy and hostile naval actions are threatening the sovereignty of American allies like Japan and the Philippines. It is communist China that has st stolen and is currently stealing most of our prized military and commercial secrets. China has stolen the designs for every one of our nuclear warheads. The Chinese cyber spies have stolen all of our, our trade secrets and all of the money that we put into uh, to, to invest in research and development. They steal and utilize. No wonder their rockets now are, 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 are as head, far ahead in the rocket program as they are. When they took the technology from us, they stole it from us. They have infected our, our uh, critical electronic technology infrastructure with malicious viruses. And then they, of course, break into our classified systems. It is China which has embarked on the most significant arms buildup since the Cold War. And I ask, who do they think is their enemy? Who do they think is their enemy? The United States of America. While we not only become uh, uh, susceptible to them, not only do we become uh, put ourselves in an inferior position by borrowing money from them, but we also end up giving that money back to them in aid programs. And that is what I would like to talk about tonight. The fact that how can we possibly borrow money from the world's worst human rights abuser, a country that looks at us as our enemy, then we become vulnerable to that country. But at the same time, while we are becoming vulnerable, we then increase our investment in the private sector in that company, but also we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars in aid programs to the communist Chinese regime. Uh, and uh, well, with that in mind, I asked the Congressional Research Service to assemble a list of programs that the Congress funds that go directly to supporting development and the economy of China. It is a partial list because there are so many programs that after weeks of work, they could not even find them all. This list that I am about to read is of projects that are funded uh, and have been funded over the last three years when the Obama, at the same time, while the Obama administration was spending one and a half trillion dollars more annually than we're taking in. So while we're spending more uh, then we're taking in by uh, a trillion and a half dollars. We are spending on programs that are going to China, and it's China who's lending us the money in order to spend that extra tr one and a half trillion dollars. This is an insane policy. And this spending on China is ongoing. I'm just giving you the facts from the last three years, and it is ongoing. To make sure we all understand exactly where we are, uh, spending or sending our taxpayer money, I am going to read a list of programs that we have funded in China and, I, uh, and, and ask, as we are going through this list, after every time I go through the money, couldn't we have spent this money better in the United States? Or wouldn't it have been better not to borrow it in the first place and add this to a trillion and a half dollars every year for the last three years that we've been putting our people into debt? So every, per every one of these things that I read, ask yourself that question. Why are we, is this in the best interest of the United States? Is it in the best interest of our children who are putting more in debt by borrowing and then giving it to China and having to pay the interest? They're going to have to pay off the loan and the interest to China in the future. So here's a partial list, and I'm going to round off the figures to an understandable number. Why did the e and many of these deal with, quote, environment. Why are we trying to make the environment in China uh, better so that the people of China can basically outcompete us uh, in, in our business dealings? That should be part of their, the cost of production in China. But no, we are picking up that cost. Not only that, we are, our people are investing in China and building their factories. Why did the EPA give, for example, $141,000 to the Institute of Environment and Sustainable Development in Agriculture to reduce greenhouse gases in China?
in China. Why did the EPA give $125,000 to the Eastern Research Group that reduces greenhouse gases in China? Why did the National Science Foundation give $63,000 to Siena College for neutrino physics at Daya Bay in China? And let me add, some of these will be repeats because we did this, this is over a three-year period, because we have several programs over the years where we're giving money to the same group in China, and that spending continues, let me add. Why did the EPA give $150,000 to China for Coal Information Institute for reducing greenhouse gases? Why did the EPA give $100,000 to Yuzhu International Corporation Center for Environmental Protection for reducing greenhouse gases? That's in China, of course. Why did the EPA give almost $300,000 to the Ministry of Environment Protection in China for reducing health risks? Don't we have health risks to the United States? Don't we have some needs of our own? Why are we giving this money to China? Why did the EPA give $150,000 to Xu Xiao, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce this right, University Department of Building Scientists for Environmental Governance in China? Why did USAID give the Asia Foundation almost $2 million, it was $1.700,000, to build environmental governance in China? Why did the USAID give a half a million dollars to the American Bar Association to build environmental governance in China? Don't we have some things in the United States where we could use a $500,000 uh, grant to some of our local communities? Couldn't they use some help? Instead, we sent it to China. But first, of course, we borrowed it from China. So to give it to them, we'll have to repay China and the interest in order to give it to them. Why did the USAID give $300,000 to the University of Massachusetts to improve the quality of judicial education in China? We're going to give $300,000 in order to improve judicial education in China? Why did USAID give $200,000 to the University of Pacific to enhance the rule of law in China? Why did USAID give $55,000 to Nextant, an NGO, to be an administrator of China program evaluations? Why did USAID give $2 million to Wine Rock International Institute for Agriculture for Sustainable Livelihoods in China? I guess we don't need any help in our farm belt. I guess our farmers don't need any help in California where they're going broke because the water has been cut off to them in order to <laughs> protect some delta smelt. Our guys are going crazy but, uh, and going broke, our farmers are, but we're going to find $2 million borrowed from China in order to give back to China in order to aid the Institute of Agriculture so that they can have sustainable livelihoods in China. Why did USAID give $2 million to the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors and NGO for sustainable livelihoods in China? Think there are any Americans that need sustainable livelihoods? Why did USAID give $2 million to the Institute of Sustainable Communities to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Oh yes, we need to make sure we, we pay all of China's environmental expenses. And otherwise they won't accept global government like our government expects us to accept. Why did USAID give $749,000, almost $750,000 to the ICF International to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why did USAID give $500,000 to the Asia Foundation for humanitarian assistance to China? Why did the USDA give $10,000 to Texas Agriculture Experiments for biolo biological control of forest insects in China? Do our forests not need this? Why are we borrowing money when we can't afford to do these things in our own country? Why did the USDA give almost $100,000 to Rutgers State University for climate change adaptation in China? Now isn't that great? We're paying for them to adapt to climate change. Then, of course, they'll join the global government, which these same people are trying to force on us. But then we are under a mountain of debt. Our children 
in order to pay for their adaptation to climate change. Not, of course, to say that anybody in the United States, our farmers, or any other industry doesn't need to adapt to the different changes that go on in the climate, even if they are natural changes in our climate. Why did the Department of Energy give $2.5 million to the University of Michigan for the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center? Shouldn't we be developing our own uh, clean energy in the United States? Instead, we borrow money from China in order to spend it in China? And then we have to pay debt, interest on that debt, and pay back the debt. Our children will, of course, be doing that. Why did the Department of Energy give $2.5 million to the West Virginia University for a U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center? Again, a research center, perhaps the same research center, but the next year. So that makes it $5 million that we've given to that research center in China. Why did the Department of Energy give $1.2 million to West Virginia's uh, university for long-term environmental and economic impacts of coal liquidification in China? That's $1.2 million to, yes, spent through the Virgin West Virginia University. Don't we have coal liquefaction, environmental studies going on in the United States that could use that money for research to make sure that our coal burns more cleanly and effectively here, rather than giving that money and information to China's benefit and borrowing it from them in order to give it to them? Why did the Department of Energy give $5.3 million to Brookhaven National Laboratory in the Daya Bay Nuclear Project in China? That's Five, over five million dollars. Why did the Department of Energy give $387,000? By the way, that's five million dollars to this nuclear facility. And let me just note that uh, in my district, we have a problem with a nuclear power plant that's going through some very serious problems right now, San Onofre. We maybe could have used that $5 million to help us correct the problems at the San Onofre plant. But no, we borrowed the money from China to give it back to them to solve their problems while our children will be forced to pay that debt off. We get no benefit out of it except a load of debt on our children. Why did the Department of Energy give almost $400,000 to the State University of Albany to study climate change in China? Ooh, yes. Why did the Department of Energy give $300,000 to the Pacific Northwest Laboratory for modeling of regional climate change in China? Again, using climate change as a vehicle to give them money that we are borrowing from them in the first place, which we will then have to repay. Why did the Department of Energy give $256,000 to the uh, Reschlinger Polytechnic Institute for Research at the Dana Bay Nuclear Daya, Daya Bay Nuclear Power Project. Again, another two, uh, $250,000 to this Daya Bay Nuclear Project. Could have been a ne the next year because this is over a three-year period uh, of some of these. By the way, it's not anywhere near all of them over the three-year period, but all of these are taken from a list over that three-year period. Yes, we could have used some of that money to make sure we didn't have a problem in our own districts. Why did the Department of Energy give $210,000 to Rutgers State University for site science for atmospheric radiation measurements for a mobile facility in China. Why are we doing that? Why are we providing them that type of a, of, of a foundation, a scientific foundation, so that they can prosper and they won't have to spend their resources with paying for that type of scientific infrastructure. Why did the Department of Energy give $135,000 to the University of Maryland for climate, climatic effects of aerosols in China? There you go, aerosols. Uh, it's an issue from way back then which uh, some of us think was not entirely reported, but now we're still giving almost $150,000 uh, to check out aerosols in China for their benefit. Why did the Department of Energy give over $500,000 to the University of Houston for a proposal to measure neutrino mixing at the Daya Bay nuclear experiment in China? Again over a half a million dollars while we're having trouble with our own nuclear program. We should be developing our own new uh, generation of nuclear power, which will be safe and we can do it, but we don't have the money to do it. Why? 
We're giving millions of dollars to China and to others that should go in to developing our own new technology here. Why, of course, we're borrowing the money from China in order to give it to them, which leaves our children in debt, and they'll have to pay it all off with interest. Why did the Department of Energy give $70,000 to Colorado State University for climate effects of aerosols, aerosols in China? Why did the Department of Energy give $19,000 to Pennsylvania State University for factors influencing energy use and carbon emissions in China? Isn't that nice that we gave the University of Pennsylvania money to study this for China so they will have the information in China and be able to use it for their benefit? rather than studying things in the United States to help us so we can do better here. Why did the EPA give over $500,000, $550,000 to be exact, 55, yeah, $550,000 to the Virginia Polytechnic Institute to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why did the EPA give almost half a million dollars to the Research Triangle Institute to reduce greenhouse gases in China? These are reduced, this is basically making equipment more efficient. Why aren't we making our equipment more efficient? And the Chinese should buy it from us rather than having us having to locate our manufacturing plants in China. Yeah, let them buy it from us. How about that? Give our own people jobs rather than borrowing money so that they can have the technology and we are going in debt so they can have the technology and our children will have to pay the debt back with interest and they will sell us the equipment. The Chinese will sell it to us in a generation. Why did the EPA give $300,000 to the Energy and Environmental Development Research Center to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why did the EPA give almost $250,000 to Research Triangle Again, probably a second year of their grant to reduce greenhouse gases in China. Why did the EPA give almost $200,000 to the China University of Petroleum in Beijing to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Can't any of our people use this research money to help our countries and our technology become cleaner and more efficient? No, we're giving it to China. And then they will sell that technology back to us after they manufacture it years ahead of us because we subsidize their R&D. Why did EPA give almost $200,000 to the China Urban Construction Design and Research Academy to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why? <laughs> Again, here we are spending money to help them design houses in China. Wonderful. None of our designers need any help. Why did the EPA give almost $300,000 to the research, Eastern Research Group to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why did the EPA give over $100,000 to Guangzhou City, China, to reduce greenhouse gases? Why did the EPA give $110,000 again? Uh, to Jingzhou International Cooperation uh, Center for Environmental Protection to reduce greenhouse gases in China. Do we have no need for this money in the United States? Does our equipment not need to be more efficient? Should we not be investigating putting money into development of, of cleaner energy sources here? At the, all this money we're giving away, we could be developing clean energy sources, if nothing else, the new generation of nuclear power plants, which is starving. For research money. No, we're giving it to China. Why did the EPA give almost $100,000 to China University Petroleum in Beijing to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why did the EPA give $200,000 to the California State University at Fullerton to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why did the EPA give $85,000 to the ICF International to build climate change management capacity in China? Why did the EPA give $135,000 to Information Institute to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why did the EPA give over $50,000 to Advanced Resources International to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why did the EPA give $31,000 to the Energy and Environmental Development Research Center for biogas development? And each and every one of these items I'm talking about is an item where we spent money out of the federal budget, took it out of the taxpayers' pockets, or actually we borrowed it from China, and then left them with the debt in their pocket, the IOU in their pocket, and gave it to China, rather than taking that money, those resources, and spending it in the United States to develop a technology here. And like I say, I've been struggling for years to get the new generation of nuclear power developed, that technology developed here, and it has been starved. 
It has not been given what it needs, and we're giving away these hundreds of millions of dollars to the Chinese, which we, of course, are borrowing, and in the end, we will pay them. We will pay them for the technology to, because they will be sending the manufactured items here. Why did the EPA give $30,000 to China Association of Rural Energy uh, Industry to reduce greenhouse gases in China? Why did the EPA give seven, almost $800,000 to the China State Environmental Protection Administration to reduce transboundary air pollution? Oh, that's great. We have to pay for everybody's air pollution in the world. The China, we're borrowing money from China, but we have to pay for their reduction of transboundary air pollution. Why did the EPA give almost $200,000 to the Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection to build environmental management capacity? Why did the EPA give $120,000 to Tinjimin Environmental Protection Bureau for water pollution management? Now, there's something we don't need any money for around our country, water pollution. I live in a coastal district. We could use that money for water pollution. We've got, we, we've got sewer pipes and water uh, purification systems that need to be upgraded. But no, we're borrowing money from China to give it to China rather than having that money spent in the United States. Why did the National Science Foundation give $62,000 to Siena College for neutrino physics at, Di again, Diana Bay Nuclear Project in China? Well, we're not spending the money here for develop our own clean nuclear energy. Why did you say give Management Systems International almost $500,000 to improve environmental governance in China? Why did you say give Vermont Law Schools, get into this, all, uh, $1,725,000 for improved environmental governance in China. Why did USAID give the Institute for Sustainable Communities uh, half a million dollars to save energy and reduce greenhouse gases in China? Don't we have any put, to, can't we put this to use in these structures in the United States? Why did USAID give the University of the Pacific a half a million dollars for environmental governance in China? Why did USAID give the American Bar Association $500,000 for environmental governance in China? Why did USAID give the Massachusetts, uh, University of Massachusetts uh, $420,000 for environmental governance in China? Why did USAID give Organizations for Economic Cooperation and Development $150,000 for development assistance in China? Why did USAID give Management Systems International $50,000 for development assistance? Why did USAID give the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors $2 million for sustainable livelihoods in China? Don't we have people in the United States who need money like that? Don't we have people indeed here who need a sustainable livelihood? Why are we giving it to China and borrowing it from them in order to give it to them and leaving our kids in debt? Why did USAID give Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors $400,000 for sustainable livelihoods in China? Why did the USDA give the University of Science and Technology of China $150,000 for research? Don't our universities need money for research for things that we can use here in the United States to make our life better? Why did the USDA give SB Group consultants $25,000 for education in China? Why did the USDA management give Management and Engineering Technologies International $40,000 to improve forest health in China? Oh, we don't need any help with our forests here, do we? Why did the USDA give Yang, uh, Yang Xu University $36,000 to improve biological controls in China? Why did the USDA give Management and Engineering Technologies International $8,000 for administrative purposes in China? Why did the USDA give the University, State, Utah State University almost $400,000 for biomass research in China? I happen to know American companies that are, and people who are investing in biomass research. Why are we giving almost $400,000 uh, to help the Chinese in biomass research, which will compete with our own companies that are trying to develop this very important and unique energy source, which, by the way, for the environmentalists who are watching who think that I may be making light of, of climate change, I support biomass and other clean energy programs that make sense. This one makes sense. Our companies are investing in it, and yet we're giving money to China 
borrowing money from, from China in order to give it to them to do biomass research to compete with our own people and put them out of business. Why did USDA give uh, Terrieta Tech EM $325,000 for administrative purposes for environmental, environmental programs in China? Why did USAID give the Institute of Sustainable Communities get into this, another $500,000 to save energy and reduce gas, greenhouse gases in China. Don't we have any need for our communities to do things in a sustainable way in the United States? No, they don't have that money now. It's in China. We borrowed it from China to give to them. And now we're going to have to pay the bill back after we've given it to them. Why did you say give the University of the Pacific $500,000 for environmental governance in China? Again, a half a million dollars. Why did you say give the American Bar Association $500,000 for environmental governance? This list goes on, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, would re uh, I would suggest uh, I would put the rest of these into the congressional record at this point. And I will uh, end my remarks tonight by suggesting that what we are doing is insane. America will never, will never survive with such a mindset of these giveaway, mind-boggling giveaway programs where we're giving money, we're giving this type of, of support to a country and a government that's totalitarian, that kills Christians and other re religious people who hates the United States, our, our, our biggest potential enemy. That is not the Chinese people. That's the Chinese government. And uh, we, the Chinese dictatorship, uh, has cover today, and the reason why these policies go on is they have cover from some of our most powerful uh, corporations. We have permitted overly subsidized American corporations to set up manufacturing facilities in China, and now they need to stand in the good graces of the Chinese government. And when I come up and say things like this, corporations in the United States try to provide cover for this Chinese dictatorship. We should not be providing aid to the Chinese. We should not be encouraging our corporations to go there and become vulnerable to the Chinese in order for a quick, quick profit. So I would suggest that over the last 10 years, since most favored trading status has been given to China, we have, uh, we have put America in a very vulnerable spot. And uh, we have, at the very least, we should reassess our relationship with China, but at the very least, cut off any aid programs that, it, that go to this communist regime, this totalitarian regime that looks at us as their enemy. I would uh, now, uh, I, I reserve the, or I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House and